I'm very aware that we're kind of short of time, then I'm going to go relatively quickly through this first little bit. Phil suggested that we start off with a little case, and this is kind of a typical patient that comes into the HD walk-in clinic, 19-year-old female who comes in um, having travelled to South Asia, um, and you all know what the diagnosis is because you've seen what the title of the lecture is, um, but works and has, and has drank, drank and ate local food and water um, and has come back and they're unwell and they've got diarrhoea and it's chronic, it's been going on for the last six weeks and they're getting cramping, bloating, bad gas, all of that, all, all of that, maybe some flushing but really no fevers and this is one of the, one of the patients from 2013 who was seen at the HTD who received the standard first line course of therapy and then failed it. And really what I want to talk to you, you guys is some data we presented in New Orleans last year, which is about the number of patients who are failing first line therapy for giardiasis. So Giardia lambda now Giardia intestinalis is extremely common, very contagious, um, found worldwide and causes a massive spectrum of clinical disease, everything from asymptomatic infection to a diarrheal illness to um, malabsorption. The mainstay of therapy has been nitrimazole based for a long time um, and most it used to be metronidazole, now we tend to use tinidazole, um, just one stat dose because it's, it's actually easier. Um, and actually the treatment for refractory giardia, given the fact that metronidazole and tinidazole have quoted efficacies of around about 90%, 89%, 90%, may even higher in some cohorts, um, then it, there isn't much in the way of an evidence base for those who fail therapy. So we had a look at everybody who came in to the HDD with Giardia um, and had proven Giardia after they'd been treated with first-line agents. Um, with a, with a, the idea was to try and answer these questions, whether or not we're seeing more refractory giard Giardia, whether or not there's something in the host that might be contributing to an increase in refractory Giardia, and whether or not they're coming back from a particular part of the world. And finally, what are we doing about refractory Giardia at our centre? So we only looked at those patients who had positive stool microscopy or PCR in our lab. So this wasn't clinical, um, uh, this wasn't clinically based, this was all based on lab results um, during the years 2008 and then 2011 through 2013. In order to be refractory and therefore be included in this, then it had to, uh, they either had to be proven giardia on microscopy or PCR that was then referred and seen in an outpatient clinic where they had positive school microscopy or PCR with us having had therapy or they were seen in one of our walking clinics or a consultant clinic found to be positive for Giardia, received therapy then at least two weeks later had a further positive stool for Giardia. So I mean, this is probably the most crucial slide. We are actually seeing more in the way of refractory giardia. So in 2008, of all the cases, only eight were refractory to first-line therapy. Uh, and as you see, this has been gradually increasing up to 2013. So it's now a much greater proportion of the overall burden of giardia that we're seeing at HTD. Now, we did introduce a PCR-based diagnostic modality in 2012, so we wanted to know whether or not the fact was we weren't actually, uh, weren't actually seeing more refractory giardia, we were just picking up more refractory giardia because the microscopy to 50 to 70 percent maybe um, sensitivity, whereas um, PCR 85 plus and some, some studies quote 100 percent sensitivity for up to 10 cysts of giardia. So um, have we just been picking it up? Um, and actually you see that even the microscopies we're seeing more and more, so uh, 15 and 17 then 22. And obviously we are picking up a few more probably with the PCR as well, but there is a genuine increasing burden of refractory disease. So there are several possible explanations for this, one of which is are we just seeing a patient cohort that are co-infected with HIV or have other problems with their immune system that means that they can't clear their Giardia. So here we see, uh, uh, we just had a look at who had been tested for things and what came up positive. So uh, only one patient had HIV and they were known to have HIV beforehand. We were not actually that good at, at looking for people who had HIV in our refractory cohort. Similarly, low immunoglobulin levels, specifically IgA, has been associated with refractory giardiasis. And again, we're not, we haven't been brilliant, actually, at looking for um, immunoglobulins. And of those, we managed to pick up two patients who, um, who did have low immunoglobulins. And of note, I know that it seems like a sort of abstract thing to check somebody's immunoglobulins. One of these patients received some immunoglobulin replacement and then cleared their giardia. So it does have an impact on management. Finally, probably the least in the way of... Um, 
evidence-based uh, things that may contribute to the failure of clearance of Giardia is having celiac disease. And there was one patient who, who, didn't ha who did have celiac disease. Again, this was pre-existing. Um, and we were, again, not brilliant at checking for it. But these are tests that really we should be doing in everybody who we suspect of having refractory Giardia. So in 2008, we see that actually, so the majority of Giardia was coming from either India or the rest of Asia, and then sort of evenly split. And then if we have a look at refractory, uh, refractory Giardia in, two, uh, in the later, later period, it's mostly coming from India. So actually, if you just have a look at the, those, uh, this may just be because we're, um, we're seeing more coming back from India overall. Actually, if you look at all of them, not just the ones that were refractory, then a smaller proportion of them are coming from India than, than those that are refractory. So it's sort of 70% um, of all the refractory ones were coming from India, whereas of all of them, only about 40% were coming from India. All of these patients got a nitroimidazole to start off with, be it metronidazole, tenidazole, with a sort of, a, as time went on, more patients getting tenidazole first line, and most of the metronidazole ones were GP referrals. And this is essentially designed to show you what kind of spectrum of different therapies people got once they got seen and diagnosed with refractory Giardia. And the answer is it's massive. And this doesn't add, this doesn't really show the level of complexity there was in treatment regimens because some patients received, say, just one further stat dose of tenidazole. Some got one on day one and one on day five, associated with maybe a couple of days worth of um, albendazole for a few days within or even afterwards. So the dosing sch schedules varied massively in between all of these. It's very difficult to draw any major conclusions as to what we, what we, um, what we used afterwards and whether or not it worked, because the numbers are quite small. So only 73 patients had refractory giardia during this time, and you can't really draw any hard conclusions. But there are a few things that I think are worth pointing out, maybe just maybe, maybe, maybe pointers. The first is that a lot of patients got tinidazole again to treat their giardia. And actually, to, just to try and explain this graph, the blue, blue bars are every time we gave this drug, whatever it might be, again, or, uh, or for the first time, to treat somebody's Giardia. So somebody might appear as one on there, so they've got a repeat dose of tinidazole, and then they score another one there because they received some peromomycin. The red bars indicate each time a final, uh, each time a, um, an individual treatment instance, a treatment event, was the final treatment event that that patient received. Yeah. So essentially, if we have a look at all of the patients who received mepicrin, for every patient who received mepicrin alone, they did not receive any further therapy. That may be because they got lost to follow up, because they didn't have symptoms anymore. It may be because they got bored or because they went mad because of the mepicrin. We don't know. But, uh, but actually, this was, uh, it's almost a surrogate for saying whether or not this, these things work. But again, it's, it has to be interpreted very, very cautiously because this is qualitative data, not quantitative. So what I found interesting, first off, was the fact that a lot of patients with tinidazole, if you just gave them another dose of tinidazole or something else with tinidazole in, so be it tinidazole, mep mepicrin, tinidazole, albendazole, uh, tinidazole, nitazoxanide, um, then a lot of them, that seemed to be the last treatment they received. Like I say, that doesn't necessarily mean they got cured, but it means that we never saw them again, we never treated them again, and we never proved that they had Giardia again. And finally, actually, mepicrin. So every patient who received mepicrin got better, or got lost to follow up, or, yeah, went mad and therefore got lost to follow up. So actually, maybe mepicrine is much more effective than we kind of previously, um, previously realised. Um, the current second line, uh, or the current second line at the time of writing was um, nitazoxanide uh, or similar. And nitazoxanide, you see, uh, actually some of them seem to get better, but not really, not really very many at all. So in summary, we have seen an increase in the number of refractory cases of Giardia at HTD between 2008 and the period 2011 to 2013. A very small minority of the patients that, where we looked for them had any kind of host contributory factor that could have, it could have led to them not clearing their Giardia. And the majority of our refractory cases, so 70% in 2011 to 2013, came from India. And that we used a huge number of different treatment strategies that were basically based upon the individual who was seeing the patient in clinic. Um, and the, the efficacy was variable. Like I say, the, what I said about mepicrine and tenizazole has to be taken with a pinch of salt. This is very, very descriptive data. So 
the thing this points most towards is that we're seeing increasing, increasing drug, drug resistance, and this has some, uh, has some merit in terms of previous, previous data. So you can develop in vitro drug resistance to gradually increasing um, concentrations of nitrimidazoles with Giardia in vitro. Um, and, and actually, we've had outbreaks in the past, in Bergen most notably, of nitrimidazole-resistant Giardia. And added to this, the fact that a lot of a lot of these cases are coming back from India, where you can get over-the-counter antimicrobials very easily, and therefore you can see a possible mechanism for this. So there are actually some problems with trying to prove this. Number one is that actually it's it's actually quite difficult to detect nitrimidazole resistance in Giardia isolates, and that's partly because there may well be a fitness cost in terms of mucosal attachment if they have if they have a have a nitrimidazole resistance uh, pattern in them. So we need to do more work. Um, and what kind of work we do from here is quite difficult because over the course of three years, we only saw 73 refractory patients. So the numbers are very, very small for a drug trial. Um, but we've, as a result of this work, we have changed what the guidance is at HTD. And the guidance at HTD now sort of mirrors more what we have evidence for, which is that the first line for refractory Giardia is now a further dose of tenidazole, because it may well work. After that, tenidazole and albendazole, which is one of the only drug combinations to actually have some trial evidence behind it. Admittedly, it was only about 20 patients, um, where it's, that's got a 90% efficacy. And then following on from that is mepocrine. Anyway, thank you very much. I'd just like to thank Prof Chiodini and Laura Nabara, who got me involved in this in the first place. Thank you.